Once again, several months have passed here on Cinema Nippon since we've covered a film by acclaimed auteur and prolific madman Takeshi Miike. We've barely scratched the surface of his filmography up to this point, looking at mostly his more high-profile projects from the period generally regarded as his most artistically interesting. That being said, the man has put to screen more than 100 films at this point, from those that are hugely commercial to those that are obscure art house. Let's put another chapter in our ongoing look at one of modern filmmaking's most unique faces, Takashi Miike. This time covering another request, which we've received several times over the past two years, 2013's acid trip of a film, Gozu. Gozu is something of an odd duck for this period of Miike's output. It's not outright horror like Audition or the later released One Missed Call. It's not quite the wacky Yakuza flick you might expect from the Dead or Alive trilogy or Ichi the Killer either. Simply put, Gozu is just plain weird. In some ways, it looks back at the previous Yakuza efforts of his. In some ways, it brings in those quality horror tropes he was honing through his mainstream success. In yet another way, it seemed to foretell the experimental nature of later films like Big Bang Love Juvenile A, aka 4.6 Billion Years of Love. Gozu is bizarre, is what we're getting at. This would likely indicate why it's one of our most requested videos on the channel, given that there's no clear reason or meaning behind Gozu. In some ways, the film can't even seem to decide what it wants to be. That's not necessarily a bad thing, however, as we'll get into. Aside from the genre-blending nature of this project, the structure of Gozu is kind of all over the place. The prologue section of the film sets it up as something of a road movie with Okichi, played by Miike veteran Sho Aikawa, and his subordinate Minami, played by Hideki Sone, another Miike regular at the time. Okichi seems unhinged from the get-go, calling a chihuahua a Yakuza attack dog in the opening, and claiming that the duo are being faced by a Yakuza attack car on their travels. As it turns out, Minami has been tasked by the boss of their gang to dispose of Okichi, hence the road movie aspect of the film. However, we're not sure if this counts as a spoiler since it happens almost immediately, but Okichi dies in an accident as Minami is transporting him through Nagoya. Despondent at having failed his mission and unsure of what to do, Minami makes a pit stop in the town to get in touch with their boss in order to get further instruction. In the process of trying to find an available telephone though, Okichi disappears from Minami's car. This effectively forces Minami to become stuck in Nagoya, tumbling down a rabbit hole he had no idea this journey would entail. And that metaphor extends further than one might expect. When you look at the writer behind Gozu, Sakichi Sato, it clarifies the insanity of the film ever so slightly. Prior to Gozu, Sato's three successive credits were Ichi the Killer and its two direct-to-video spin-offs. In fact, Gozu was also intended for a DVD release, but was released to theaters after its success at the 2003 Cannes Film Festival. When one considers the insanity of Ichi, Sato's involvement does help frame Gozu's proceedings a little, where Ichi served as a clever inversion of a mystery revenge plot and of the Yakuza world at large, Gozu takes the genre in a whole new direction, namely through the looking glass. Miike has long been interested in the plight of outsiders, whether through the war orphans and half-Japanese protagonists of the Black Society trilogy or the titular visitor of Visitor Q, and Minami being an outsider to Nagoya is no different here. A Tokyoite, he is constantly reminded by the denizens of Nagoya that he ain't from Nagoya, are you? In many ways, Minami acts as the straight man to their comedic and insane counterpoints. However, there's a quote we keep almost referencing that we feel would make more sense if we put it out in the open. As Lewis Carroll wrote in Alice in Wonderland, quote, But I don't want to go among mad people, Alice remarked. Oh, you can't help that, said the cat. We're all mad here. I'm mad. You're mad. How do you know I'm mad, said Alice. You must be, said the cat, or you wouldn't have come here. As Gozu descends further into its madness, it becomes apparent that this parallel is stronger within this film than in any of Miike's other films concerning outsiders which we've covered. Where those films mostly focus on injustice, racial discrimination, and family breakdown and buildup, Gozu is more interested in the sheer madness of Nagoya, and all who come within its bounds. Within the first few minutes of Minami's visit to a Nagoya restaurant, this madness is exemplified. The patrons are a man who stares at Minami, and another who hogs all the time at the restaurant's public phone, debating whether it was hot or not several days prior. At one point, when Minami is being served by the staff and accepting their complimentary food, the film literally replays this weatherman's audio over and over, further driving home the ridiculousness of this never-ending conversation. Later, we observe the weatherman speaking with the staring man, 
recalling the entirety of his phone conversation. The staring man, meanwhile, seems blown away by the audacity of the man on the other end of the phone to disagree about the weather. Minami is most definitely not from Nagoya, as evidenced by his critical eye for all of these citizens. What's more, he grows angry when he's given free food after only ordering coffee. The staff assures him that it's complimentary, and he eats it in several huge bites, only to immediately vomit. This occurs again when Minami checks into a local hotel for the evening and is offered by the female proprietor of the business a back rub. Again, he vehemently denies the opportunity, but she insists that it's complimentary. Just like Alice, Minami is unsure of his surroundings and the locals offering him strange food and favors. The parade of insanity continues when, just prior to visiting the hotel, Minami gets a flat tire and comes across a man with a half-white face. He claims that he was born without melanin in that portion of his face, only for the camera to immediately zoom in and highlight the obvious nature of the makeup was likely intentional. We're supposed to feel bad for any hardship this man has encountered thanks to his face, but also to doubt the veracity of his claims. It's a mad world in Nagoya, and Minami is right there with us, completely unsure whether this man is helpful or working against Minami. As you can see, the parallels between Alice in Wonderland and Gozu run deep, but that's not all the film has to offer. For the most part, the visuals after the first 10 or 15 minutes become utterly dreamlike in their own regard. The American wife of a store owner offers Minami advice in broken Japanese that turns out is printed on cue cards on the wall. This was a spur-of-the-moment inclusion as the actress spoke Japanese so haltingly and awkwardly for Miike that he decided to transliterate her lines into Roman characters, then include the cards bearing her lines in the film itself. Accidental or not, the image is haunting, as though Minami has stumbled upon an oracle or a prophecy within this mad world. In another sequence, we're not entirely sure if Minami is dreaming when he learns of an incestuous pair of siblings and their bull-headed offspring. Think the Minotaur of mythology, only wearing briefs, and you get the idea. The way the scene is played, it seems real until after it passes, at which point we're left just as uncertain as Minami whether it was a dream, a vision, or a true encounter with the supernatural. On the note of the supernatural, don't even get us started on the ending. Basically, partway through the film, Ozaki reappears, only now he has been reborn as an adult woman. We're once again right there with Minami, questioning whether this is the real life or whether it's fantasy. Femme Ozaki insists she is his fellow gang member, though, and Minami goes along with it. This situation reaches something of a fever pitch at the climax, which we won't spoil here. Nightmare visuals aside, there's one final major theme seeming to run through Gozu, and it's something that the film shares in kind with Visitor Q and arguably Audition, both of which we've covered previously. All of these films bear in common their treatment of women, showing how they are abused in some cases by the men in their lives, but how ultimately Miike, or at least the writers he works with, hold womankind in high reverence. Visitor Q showed this in how the family's mother, upon growing a spine for herself, assumed her position as the backbone of the family unit. Audition, on the other hand, showed the power that women may wield against unsuspecting men. Gozu seems to take a less obtuse approach while ironically borrowing a visual motif from Visitor Q, that of a mother's milk. Gozu is obsessed, especially in the second half of the film, with mothers and their milk. We observe the aforementioned calf spawn of the incestuous siblings. Toward the end of the film, we see a hefty amount of lactation and a literal birth amidst a pool of milk. We're in fact treated to the sentiment that, quote, those who deliver milk are better than those who consume it, end quote. Miike here seems to be showing, as with Visitor Q's mother, how mothers are the fundamental foundation of a family, and indeed of all human life. Not to sound as though Miike is being puritanical here, but he also explores the perverted nature of human relations in this same manner. Basically, he shows how two siblings unable to keep their hands off one another produce a monster of mythical proportions. The very downfall of Minami's and Ozaki's boss is women, in spite of his erectile dysfunction requiring him to place metal spoons up his rear in order to even engage in sex. Miike, in short, is showing how animalistic and sex-crazed the human species can be, but how, in his eyes, for healthy relationships to flourish, those who produce milk, or at least those with the capacity to do so, must be present. 
Of course, this could just be a convenient, consistent visual motif with no real bearing on Miike's worldview and thoughts on the human condition. Gozu is a staggeringly bizarre film that will stick with viewers for weeks or months after seeing it for the first time. Even by Miike's standards, this is a strange one, and it's a film which is sure to inspire discussion, whether it be about potential meanings or how utterly weird it is. Let us know what you think the film is about in the comments below. It's an experience that you won't soon forget, for better or for worse.